Hi, my name is Robin, and I'm a volunteer at A Brighter Way. And I'm Adam, the executive director of A Brighter Way. And welcome to Conversations About A Brighter Way, where we talk about what it's like for those individuals who've had experience with the criminal justice system. Call it home, people don't answer, people don't support, they support you when you're there, but when you're gone, they forget about who you was, like you vanished. Family members, friends, mentors, mentees, mental health professionals, and employees all play vital roles aiding formerly incarcerated people transitioning back into society. For me, it's turning off the fix-it mode. Patience is really important, and sometimes that's just sitting with somebody, hearing those things that are painful over and over and over again. The advice I give to any job applicant is to be yourself. I want to get to know you and I want to hire you and whoever you are and whatever experiences you've had in the past, you might be able to bring a diverse perspective to our business. The tagline at A Brighter Way is re-entry through relationships. And in season two of our podcast, we delve into those relationships which play a pivotal role in the re-entry process. Essentially, what we're looking at when you come out of prison is your support group, people, places, and things. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. So if you go back to those same people, that same environment and doing those same things, you are going to be getting the same outcomes. week we will be speaking to Allison, Kat, and Judy. And of course, don't forget Adam. I will let each of them introduce themselves in a second. Adam and I had a discussion on how to bring up the topic of therapy, mental illness, and trauma. And if it sounds like I'm reading from a script, it's because I am. I just really want you guys to know this next coming up information. So here's where I'm coming from. I have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and a personality disorder, NOS, not otherwise specified, with schizotypal and borderline traits. So I am there with you to the people living with the mental illness and personality disorder. And Adam, can you tell us some stats? Here are a few stats. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, 21% of U.S. adults, 52.9 million people experienced mental illness in 2000. For incarcerated people, those rates are much higher. The American Psychological Association reports that 64% of jail inmates, 54% of state prisoners, and 45% of federal prisoners have reported mental illness concerns. Let me also speak to the fact that that's a self-report, so the numbers are probably fairly low. Approximately half the people of the in U.S. jails and over a third of the population of the U.S. prisons have been diagnosed with a mental illness. During re-entry, mental illness complicates an already difficult path for returning home. That's why we are having this discussion on mental health today. And I hate speaking for Adam, but I think we both agree that it's really important conversation to have. Now I'll get on to our host of the podcast, which I'm really excited about. So Judy, can you introduce yourself? My name is Judy Gardner, and I'm the executive director for the National Alliance on Mental Illness here in Washtenaw County. We are one of the over 600 affiliates across the country who provide education, support, and advocacy for those who live with mental illness or those that live in support. I came to NAMI 12 years ago because I had a loved one, two loved ones, who were suffering from mental illness and have since realized that there's actually a lot more folks that I'm close to that are suffering. I've had my own experience with poor mental health at a couple times in my life. I'm very passionate about this. I'm very passionate about breaking down stigma. And I will speak today a little bit about my role with coming to NAMI as I'm considered a person, a support person. So I want to talk a little bit about living in support of someone with a mental illness and coming from that perspective. I appreciate being included in the conversation. Thank you. Kat, what about you? Hey, everyone. My name is Kat Leighton. I use she, her pronouns, and I've been working in mental health in the capacity of prison reform, jail diversion, abolition, and public defense since I really graduated and was in, in graduate school. The subject of mental health is really important to me, not only as a social worker that works in the field of mental health, but also as a person with my own mental health conditions. I can explain more of that whenever we get on with the conversation, but 
I spent most of my career in, in experience and engagement focusing on decarcerating the jails while dismantling injustices within the criminal legal system. And I've interned in for various organizations and worked in the legal, nonprofit, and prison reform fields. And I'm really passionate about working collaboratively with community organizers and organizations on abolishing the punitive and carceral state. Thank you. Allison, go ahead. Hey everyone, my name is Allison Goreen. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I currently work as a clinical therapist at Wise Mind Psychology. Like everyone else, I'm really passionate about raising awareness about mental health, but also destigmatizing mental health issues or diagnoses, especially for people who have been incarcerated. The way that I got introduced to this is through my own personal struggles, being diagnosed with different things, but in general, just feeling like something was off. And I handled that by using a lot of drugs and alcohol, which got me to jail and through different special diversion programs and in other places. And what I learned is that mental illness doesn't discriminate. And another thing that I learned is that I had a lot of advantages based on some of the way that I look and the access that I had to resources and the family support that I had and essentially money that was really helpful. But I'd say the best, one of the most important things for me was meeting people and realizing that we were all suffering from something, but that we didn't have to suffer alone. And all the people looked different, came from different places, had different backgrounds. But I'd say that was the first step to healing for me. So that's what I'm passionate about. I wanna make that available to people that feel like they're alone. Thank you. So Judy, you had brought up something that you wanted wanted to discuss of what it's yeah. like dealing with a mental illness and the family member. So can you speak on that? Right. Yeah. I have a son who has a story. I can, I can share his story. He allows me to do that. I have a son who's now 27. He had suicide ideation when he was in high school. He shared with me that he already had a plan on how he was going to take his life. And he was getting good grades, but he was really thin. And that's when I got the help from Nami. Fast forward, he's 27 now and he lives on his own. And I mean, there's so much that went on in between. And there was so much learning that I needed to do and so much understanding. Because there were times when I would see behaviors in him that I would say, oh, you can do better or, or get out of bed or, or just figure it out. I mean, I was just really didn't realize how this mental illness affected every aspect of his being and how he was trying so hard to push through. And so as a person and a family member, family is so imperative that you get people in your family to provide the support. And you also, I, I'll say this, I'll back up a little bit because I'm trying not to take too much time. But one of the best things my son taught me was he was honest with me about what he was feeling like. And I worked really hard at believing him. Mm -hmm. And I had to work hard at believing him because when you have people who are functioning in one way and then they tell you that they can't function in another way, it's difficult. And I learned to trust him and build that trust. And I think that really helped his wellness and recovery period. He says to me often, had I not been listening or helping or he didn't have the support, he probably would have either landed in jail or dead. So it's just having patience and kindness and empathy and understanding. And I find like that that people who live with mental illness and the stigma that it brings are often so terribly judged. And I, I can't even put it into words. The pain I feel now that I know what I know, if right. that makes any sense. Now that I know what I know what's involved in suffering and how people can hide and push through and show you their best self, but underneath is despair. I want to interject something, too, because we had somebody who came in recently who's been incarcerated for a total of 15 years, and the stigma in there is often even greater. He came in, somebody in the room referred him to us, and he came to us open, ready to do the work that he needed to do, but he needed somebody to do it with him, and he needed to know that he wasn't alone. Right. Yeah in yeah. the space. And so I think this is one of the things that we're trying to do 
in this space is let people know that it's not only okay, it's okay that you do feel alone. It's okay that you do feel that nobody else understands. But the only way that you're going to find out that people do is if you share your story with somebody. And he told us after the fact that he was on the brink of suicide before he came in and it took one person. And then we introduced him to one person and he's basically been adopted into this family now and he feels a part of something. So he doesn't have the same issues. And the reason why I bring that up is not only because it's relative to the population that we work with and the population that we're speaking most directly to, but also because I watch the anxiety even in this room as we're talking about how are we going to share this story? Exactly. Me? Anxious? No way. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never anxious. But, <laughs> but when we do, but, but when we are able to frame these in another way too, where it's not, it doesn't always, it's conversation. Right. Ultimately, that's what counseling is. Yep. It is exactly that. It is conversation. It is somebody to bounce these ideas off from. It's realizing that you're not, I don't know if anybody's ever read Bozos on the Bus. No, but what you're yeah. saying about being alone versus lonely, that's what I think about because whenever I work with clients and they express this alone feeling and this aloneness, I let them know, yes, you feel alone, but you're not lonely. You have an entire community of support around you ready for you to tap into. But a lot of people don't have that support or accessibility to that support. And that's why it's really cool to hear Judy express how much empathy and love that she gave to her son who is experiencing mental health illnesses or conditions and and it just really speaks volumes to the the needed support for people everywhere and the accessibility needed. Thank you, Kat, because even with Itami, that's what we do. We had our we had our volunteer appreciation event on Sunday. Several people showed up, but a lot of people of course didn't. And we get that because we understand the anxiety that's involved. But it was such a loving, wonderful experience because so so many people got up and said, This work that I do and volunteering and the hours that I spend is so therapeutic because I I feel so safe. And even just hearing everyone introduce themselves when people were, you all were introducing yourselves and acknowledging and stating that, being very open with, I live with, is how we frame it at NAMI. It also made me feel safe in this space. And I found that even with people who come to work on our boards and people, even though they're working at NAMI and volunteering at NAMI, you still have to feel safe. And it takes those relationships grow and then people come more out. And, and a lot of people have been really out just this year and have been volunteering for 10, 12 years about their own mental health journey. So it's so important to create that, right, to create that sense of safety. I think what I hear you saying to Judy is that you're creating a validating environment for someone. And I think that's yeah. the most important thing, too, is someone experience like for me personally, experiencing a mental illness and a mental health conditions and being neurodivergent, me not having an invalidating environment for the most of my life definitely exacerbated yeah. my symptoms. And it made it not at anyone's fault. Like, I, you know, I had a mother and a father who loves me very much. They just didn't know how to handle and experience and see and hear someone with mental health conditions until recently through education and conversation and storytelling. So like just mm -hmm. creating that validating environment for someone and just being at support for them just goes a really long way. It really does. And the storytelling is invaluable. Just again, like I said, when I came on the call, I'm feeling a little kind of out of the loop because I'm calling in and I don't see faces or see people to connect. But I feel safe, you know, sharing. It's so important. Allison, give me a little bit of feedback because I know some of the work you did and some of the work you did before you came into your current situation. And I know how much you care about the people you work with and how far that goes. Because what I don't hear is what a great therapist you are. What I hear is, <laughs> is what a great human being you are. Yeah. So share a little bit with us. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully you hear both eventually oh. one day. So, <laughs> I would also like to be a great therapist, but I think a lesson that I've learned doing this work too, and, and uh, Judy, you said it took a lot of patience with your son. For me, it's turning off the the fix it, mm. the fix it mode, because yeah. when people are suffering and people want to kill themselves because they really do or they hate themselves so much, you just want to say, stop, just come over here with me. Just do this. You know, what you need is yeah. to go, you know, get a job here or go to school here or do anything else besides feel how you're feeling. And that right there is invalidating. So to me, it's 
Patience is really important. And sometimes that's just sitting with somebody for a long time, hearing those things that are painful over and over and over again, making sure that you're able to take care of yourself at the end of the day, that you don't take on that pain, that you can still trust that, that person's going to be able to, to be there the next week and that you've set them up the best that you can, but not running around trying to save or trying to fix. So I think the patient part is very, very important. And along with the person, I think change ha- happens when the person makes the choices on their own, not a choice to change, not hitting rock bottom and becoming, you know, so, so tired, but you might offer opportunities, resources, volunteer things, and it works better if people have their agency to make that choice to get engaged somewhere or to share their story on their own versus being pushed. I think you hit something that I talk about all the time that I think is hugely important. Nobody in this room is a mechanic. Yeah. So you're not fixing anything. Yeah. People are not no. meant to be fixed. They're meant to be healed. Yeah. And yeah. I think when we understand that and we approach it that way, a lot of the people, I mean, that's how they feel when they come into these things. They feel like they're coming into the garage. They feel like you're going to put them up on the hoist and look underneath the chassis and they're not ready for that because they oh, so true. they feel broken. And so I, I think one of the things that something like this does, like conversation does, like Robin talking about this idea in the beginning, she had to script this because this is personal. But one of the ways that we lead people is by being vulnerable. Right. Mm. And so by, by being vulnerable and sharing ourselves with one another, we give other people permission to be their whole selves. Right. Totally. I really appreciated Robin's vulnerability in the beginning with your diagnoses because in the professional world, it is very looked down upon until recently to take mental health days and to talk about your mental health and to be open about it. And I, especially in the mental health field, you'll, you'll hear things like, oh, that's definitely a person with borderline or oh, right. that person is so borderline or yeah. oh, that per- oh, that person has this or oh, that person. And it's just it's minimizing people to their symptoms and it's not looking at the person for the whole human and being that they are and sharing that is just so incredibly difficult and so I appreciate that as someone Thank you. with major depressive disorder generalized anxiety disorder obsessive compulsive disorder and another personality disorder myself like it's very it's very traumatizing and very uh, dehumanizing to be labeled something and then to try to prove to everyone that you're more than that label right it's judgmental it's judgmental and that's even the label itself can be at first it was like, yay, I feel seen. Something makes sense. There's a reason why that I'm feeling or thinking these things. And then at the end of it all, it's just for insurance purposes. Let's yeah. just manage my symptoms. Let's manage your yeah. symptoms. Like whatever you want to call it, let's manage the symptoms that you're experiencing to give you the best quality of life that you deserve. So I appreciate you sharing that. And thank you. Being I do too, Robin. Thank you, Judy. You are not your illness. You know, I have, I live with a sonic illness and I would hate for someone to say, well, she She's got blah, 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 you know, you know, it's, you, you're not your illness. And I tell my son that too, you know, he's like, well, I'm bipolar. No, you're not. You're Kevin. That's who you are. And you're brilliant. And, and he is, I mean, he, he's good at so many things. And I'm, you know, my staff, I, I will say, even at, at NAMI, I've worked with people who have lost jobs at other large organizations I won't mention. And they come here and I get the best of the best just because I'm meeting them. Maybe they needed accommodations of 15 or 20 hours. And they're awesome. And and we're awesome together. And it, it it's so simple. But you want everyone to get that, right? You want the world to get that. And we lose out as humans when we marginalized folks, regardless of who they are or where they're coming from. And expect those, especially those folks that are reentering from being, um, and, and I, and I want to get that properly, but reentering society, I can't imagine dealing with that and, and having to deal with the mental health at the same time. I, I just can't imagine how difficult that would be. Yeah, let's pivot to see what you guys would suggest for those reentering society and that you are able to be diagnosed in prison, correct? Uh, yeah, but the question is, do you trust them? I mean, when I came when I mm. came into prison, they were using the MMM, MMPI 2 or something like that. And the fact that you committed a felony made you antisocial personality right. disorder right off the rip. And can we talk about the problem with that? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> because we don't have that much time. Right. But I think that the problem goes back even further because like you were talking about, 
about, and I think Judy was talking about, these ideas of these diagnoses that people are getting at an earlier age, and they're telling them this, and now they're, now they've, it's a learned helplessness that takes place, yeah. because I'm never going to be right. Yeah. It's like we've turned, we've turned the world into the land of misfit toys, wow. and everybody feels like they're trying to find their way back to reality. It just so happens that some of us end up in a place that everybody else looks at as the land of misfit toys. So I'm going to start this out with my piece of advice, even though I'm not a trained professional. After 27 years and 17 years of some deep dive into who I am and what makes me tick, and, and I do a pretty good job counseling myself on a regular basis and surrounding myself with the right people that I can actually have these conversations with, that would be the first piece of advice that I would give somebody is find someone. Find someone that you can talk to. Find someone who will be honest and talk to you because I have learned as much from being there for other people as I ever have from doing a deep dive with myself. So when you have the right people that you can exchange things with, when you have your wife that you can talk to, and I mean really talk to because everybody doesn't necessarily talk to their wife on that level. You need to have somebody that you're going to get honest feedback from that you know has your best. They have your best at heart and be able to be honest and raw with them so that you yeah. can figure some things out because I've learned some things just by speaking that I never would have learned from hearing it from somebody else. I've said something and been like, holy crap, I've never thought about <laughs> it that way before. And it only happens through conversation. Right. So that's my biggest thing is find somebody and do it scared. Because if you wait until you're not afraid, then you'll never do it. So true. I tell people, when I actually, when I came to NAMI, I said out loud, just like you were saying, I found my tribe. But what was so odd for me, Adam, is, and I have a partner who's great. My husband is wonderful. But I found my tribe, but they didn't look like what I thought my tribe would be. They were all over the place. 80 years old, white, I'm black. I mean, all kinds. And it was a beautiful thing because mental illness doesn't discriminate. And I found I was heard and I was encouraged and supported. And you're right. You have to find your people that get you. My advice would also be don't give up and also say no. So I think mental health care in an institution can sometimes become punitive. And you feel like this is your only option. You can only see this doctor, this psychiatrist, take these pills, do these things, or else this. And so my advice would be, when you take that leap of faith, whether it comes from trusting somebody who recommends an organization or a therapist or a psychiatrist, take it. If you don't like what you're hearing or if you're not pleased with your interaction, say no, it's okay. You don't have to continue treatment with somebody that you don't connect with and mm. it's totally normal. And don't give up. Don't say, I, I tried this, therapy sucks, psychiatry sucks, everything sucks, that's it. Education helps, too. Education helps, too. And I think that I, I want to speak to one part because I heard something that's really cool. No is a complete sentence. Mm. Yeah. That is very hard <laughs> for people it coming is. from prison because we're constantly in the defensive. We're constantly feeling mm. the need to explain. You don't have to. No is a complete sentence. That's the that's same right. for people with trauma history, mm -hmm. too. Like people who have extensive trauma history, which you do when you are incarcerated. That is very traumatic. And there's a need to over explain things and there's a need to justify mm. things when sometimes, like you said, no is just enough. So yeah. I actually take that. I appreciate you saying that, Allison, about staying determined yeah. is what I think about. Because for me, I started therapy when I was 19 years old because I was having panic attacks from an, and flooding of intrusive thoughts just coming into my brain. Just I couldn't go to school. Mm. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was just I was having anxiety and panic attacks every, nearly every day for a week mm -hmm. because of my intrusive thoughts and the content that they were. I found a therapist and I was 19 years old and I've been in therapy therapy ever since and I'm 30 now. So like, I know some people are like, oh, you'll only need it for two years. I'm an advocate yeah. for, for a many, many years. Therapy. Lifetimer. Yeah, like, right. Exactly. I think it's beneficial. I think there's a lot of, but there's also more modalities to healing than just therapy. And I think Absolutely. that's really important to, to, to clarify as well. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about the modalities and stuff, and there's a lot of different ways that you can, you, that you can do this in prison. It's pretty much one size fits all. It's CBT or nothing. 
that gets really complicated too. So one of the things that we tried to do while we were in there was, is we tried to introduce other modalities and we tried to use ones that had multiple different things to it. If you ever get a chance to, or haven't already look into a program called houses of healing, houses oh. of healing really kind of demonstrate the whole concept is, is what the name says is that they didn't just to be, have to be houses of punishment. She realized that it could be houses of healing. And so she took these, these multiple different ways to it, bibliotherapy, CBT, dialectic, you know, all of these things are kind of thrown in there. And and so you never know what part is going to connect with somebody. Like Allison said, don't try something once and be like, oh, nothing, nothing works. You know, nothing works if you don't work. That's part of it because it's not going to happen for you. Therapy is not magic. Yeah. You know, you guys do some alchemy, but you're not magicians and you're not wizards. And I don't think any, but anyway, <laughs> I'm not well, sure. No, no. In another lifetime, hopefully. <laughs> but I think that's a really good point. It's not magic. And that's something that's beneficial to remind myself of, which is, you know, to counter the fixing mindset is I see most people one hour a week. It's one freaking hour. That's it. I'm not that powerful. Right. I'm not. They're going to change on their own. They're going to find their own non-traditional methods outside of that. We can explore them. We can talk about it. And hopefully we need all, not just one thing. Yeah. And it's the 50 minute hour, isn't it? It's 55, 55, <laughs> 55 minutes. There's an extra five in there. Mm -hmm. I think too is, is realizing that there are more than one ways to, to healing. And there are a lot of ways to, to finding peace internally. And for me there, I really like talking about, like, I also realize that therapy and whatever, however you're healing, it takes work and it takes hard work and it takes dedication. And like, yeah, it, that's the hardest thing is I think I spent like maybe the majority of my early 20s just being like, oh, if I go once a week for an hour or 55 minutes, I'm going to be perfect and I'm, everything's OK. And then my therapist will be like, what did you work on this week over your goals? <laughs> and I'm like, to be honest, I forgot that I had goals. <laughs> yeah. I do. I forget that I have goals sometimes. And then you have to be compassionate, right? So what about the self-compassion? That's very important. I want to speak to something really quick because it just dawned on me and, and I, I will forget it. My mind is a saturated sponge. It has not escaped me the fact that including Judy on the phone call that I'm the only male in this conversation. And often this is the case when you see people that get into the helping professions, when you see people who engage in this kind of work on either side of it, a lot of times it tends to be women and it has been society has almost feminized the idea of asking for help, for seeking for that kind of growth. And so when we're talking about people that are coming out of prison, that is a hyper masculine environment, toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity. Right. We did yeah. a, we did a program. If you ever get a chance to see it called Tough Guys and it's spelled G-U-I-S-E. It's it's amazing. It's from the 80s. The clothes are a little bit off, but the message is beautiful. The discussion we had this morning on Facebook Live was toxic masculinity and it's not just toxic to the individual it does it does toxify the body in a lot of different ways we know what happens when your mind is not functioning properly when you've got everything framed in the negative this is one of the reasons why when Robin and I started to talk about this is I thought this was so important I don't think there's going to be a rush to go get help but I think the fact that there's that we're talking about this gives them the opportunity to be able to do so and I want everybody to know that it's the exact opposite of what you've been told. This is strength. Being vulnerable yeah. is strength. Right. Yeah. You know, I described it one time and I hate to do this. I know I, I talk all the time. That's that's what I do. But, yeah. I, but I described it. I described it to people one time is, is that you grew up and you grew up with this suit of armor, not the old chain mail version, but the steel one with the big old trap over your mm -hmm. face and stuff. <laughs> And those things are really effective for when you're in a battle and somebody's got a broad axe or a sword or something like that. But we forget about one aspect of that, that every time they they came out of battle, they had to bang the dents out of that suit of armor. Because if you kept putting that suit of armor on with those dents, it would hurt you in itself. And many of us are wearing those suits of armor and think it's protecting wow. us and it's hurting us. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a yeah. really powerful yeah. analogy. 
very powerful. So I want to ask Allison about what it's like, what therapy is like. If no one has gone to therapy, what can they expect? And then hopefully Kat can jump in because you have talked about going to your therapist too. Yeah, absolutely. Allison. Yeah, that's a really, a really good question. I'll say what it's like, like for me as a therapist, what somebody should expect. And I think in most, for most therapies is the first or second session is going to be a lot of questions, really all directed at you, your history, your mental health history, your medical history, your trauma history. We won't dive too deep into trauma usually in like the first or second session because that just wouldn't be fair to have somebody open up about their entire story, but just a general basic question. Similar to like what Adam was talking about, hopefully after that, a few more sessions are really going to be a discussion, a conversation. That's what I would hope people get revolving around rapport building. So usually people need to know their therapist a little bit and the therapist wants to know the client a little bit to create a safe environment, a comfortable environment for somebody to be vulnerable because people have these armors up. Like Adam was saying, people have this steel because they learn that being vulnerable was very scary or bad things happened when they were vulnerable. So in order to break some of that down, the most important thing when you do go to therapy is that you connect with your therapist on some level, they make you feel safe. I hope that answers the question. And non-judgmental. Like, and non-judgmental, yeah. And like, that's like the, that was probably the biggest thing for me is is feeling like I had a safe space to be able to talk to someone and openly mm-hmm. and honestly, where I could tell them like, hey, like, this is what's going on. These are my intrusive thoughts. This is what I'm experiencing. And I don't have a judgment face looking at me and the other, because there's, yeah. there's so much shame around that stuff. It's hard yeah. to talk about those things. Well, and I think part of it is just the therapist hopefully they they listen and what I always keep in mind is they're meeting you where you're at once you feel comfortable in therapy once that rapport is there then the therapist might circle back to some of those things that you said usually in the intake you know hey what you know what brought you here well I don't really know but I'm scared of this or I'm feel like I want to kill myself every day we're not going to dive into that in the first or second session but a good therapist might pick up on where they need to circle back on that and when that person might feel comfortable to be challenged But initially, it's just meeting the client where they're at. And then you'll begin talking about hopefully you feel the client will feel comfortable enough talking about some of the issues of why they stepped into a therapist office in the first place. Right. I think something that Allison said that was super important that I think uh, could be echoed for many, 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 many years is the fact that you need to meet people where they're at. That is so special and so crucial and something that I bring to the work that I do in my professional world and and even in my personal world when I'm just talking with friends, like just being a person, another human being connecting with another human being, regardless if they're my client or not, and I have that power dynamic or not. It's it's recognizing that this is a person with lived experience, with their own history, with their own story to tell, and just seeing them, meeting them where they're at and practicing to seeing that. And I, there's so many people and practitioners that have good intentions, just mean really well, but, and they think this is what the client needs mm. rather than what is it that the client wants? What yeah. is it that the person wants to right. feel healed, to feel whole? And that's so special and, and important. Right. And valued right. because I think right. that's what you do is when you honor somebody's humanity, you show that they're valued. And especially totally. with a lot of people who have been through traumas, they might feel valued for one thing whatever happened to them was the one thing especially when you're talking about some specific traumas Mm -hmm. and so it's really interesting when you start seeing people that understand the difference between value and worth you know but sometimes it has to be seen through somebody else's eyes first and i think that's what a lot of times therapy has the ability to do is let you borrow somebody else's eyes Absolutely. I also want to throw in there really quick. It's sometimes people who we all know where to go, right? We all know, but some people don't know where to even start. Can we talk a little bit about that? Or, you know, how, how do you start? I mean, there's some people that never see a doctor, let alone knowing that there are people, a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist and what's the difference. 
and where does someone start? Great and challenging question. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. there's, there's, there's honestly, in my opinion, there's too much information, especially nowadays with like social media and TikTok and all these platforms. Not that I'm dissing any, any platform at all, but I think there is like misinformation and can make it really confusing about what is the difference between psychiatry, a therapist, outpatient, inpatient, mm-hmm. and what the hell do I need? And how do I even know that? So I think a good starting place would would be county-based mental health treatment or just psychologytoday.com yes. if you are internet savvy because you can filter filter different features so you can find a therapist you know based on their gender identity you can find one that takes your insurance and things like that so if you don't want to do the route of looking at the back of your health card and calling the health insurance company and waiting on hold, I think psychology today. And you can also find psychiatry that way, too. That's a really good one. And also don't forget your local mom, because that's what we are here to provide those resources. Because that's a big thing. I got a question today from a professional that said I, I need some help, but I don't know where to go. Yeah, it mm. just shows you how little that we talk yeah. about it. And if you're formerly incarcerated in Washtenaw County, then contact the Brighter Way because that's what we do is this is about to be changing. It's funny because I actually put this into our tagline, reentry through relationship. And now I want to change reentry because <laughs> satellites reenter the, the atmosphere and space shuttles do people reintegrate back into their communities. And so I want to get into more of a reintegration. But the idea is, is that a brighter way is a mentoring program as it's its cornerstone. We help people navigate the systems that have been oppressive and designed to be oppressive. They're changing, mm-hmm. but we can help help you find people that will work with you that understand what you've been through and not judge you. You talked about rapport building. One of the things that is the advantage of having somebody who's formally incarcerated working with somebody who was formerly incarcerated is what's understood doesn't need to be said. There's immediate rapport because you've been there. And it's the same thing with people who go through the military, who've graduated from the same schools and things like that, but to a greater degree. Washtenaw County, if you're formally incarcerated, give us a call, show up, and we will get you to where you need to be. What's That's the phone beautiful, number? Adam. Yeah, that was beautiful. Mm-hmm. What's the phone Thank number? Thank you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you my <laughs> phone number because I because, okay. because I want to make sure that you get hooked up with the right people. And we try and do a strength-based idea here. So my number is 734-304-2629. Now, I know this is going out on a national level. So if you're in Sacramento, California or something like that, though, I would love to try and help you. I'm probably not going to be much assistance. So our funding and our program is based in Washtenaw County. But unfortunately, my heart knows no boundaries. So we'll try to do the best we can. Okay, so our final question (laughs) I want to ask your advice to if someone is struggling, what can you tell them that would give them a little bit of peace with their mental health? So I actually, I have a poem that I used to really like. I still do. I like writing poetry. I would not call myself a poet, though. But I just really enjoy the act of writing poetry. And I wrote one about I was in a very, like, really bad episode of my depression. And I, it felt like someone, my mom or someone just be like, oh, just go smile and choose to be happy today and it'll, it'll fix you right up. And I remember thinking like, that's not all it takes. Like I'm smiling right. and pretending, right. but it's not getting any better. So like what's going on? And it turns out I would tell myself tomorrow's a new day. Tomorrow is a new day. Tomorrow is a new day. Mm-hmm. And eventually, eventually, tomorrow came. And so Mm -hmm. what I tell people who are experiencing mental mental health struggles and people and people that I work with and people I work alongside is that tomorrow will eventually come. Zoom out of your life a little bit. And this one moment in time will feel minuscule compared to the life and longevity that you have ahead of you. And for some people who are experiencing suicidal ideation, that's not the best advice. (laughs) Because for them, tomorrow 
maybe isn't the new day. So it's just remembering that you are a person that deserves to be seen, that deserves to be heard and finding someone that will just see you and just validate you because there's so many people and so many resources out there that just, I I was in so many relationships in my life and I was just having really chaotic relationships, interpersonal relationships. And then all of a sudden I meet my wife and it's like a really great relationship. And I'm like, how, Mm. why is this any different? And my therapist told me, you have a validating and environment now. So it's just yeah. creating that for someone else and, and creating that for yourself. Affirmations, letting yourself know that like you deserve love and you deserve happiness. And you're not alone. Judy, mm-hmm. what other advice would you give? Everything that I've just heard, but really knowing that there are, you're not alone. It's tough because even when I was having some dark days of a very bad depressive episode, you, you, you just want it over because the pain is so bad. But there's always hope. There's always something. You just never give up hope. That is what I would leave hope with. You just don't give up hope because once you, there is a group, there is someone that understands you and is like you. And there's a community that is looking for you like you're looking for them, whether it's a single person or a group or a brighter way. You know, I love that name, brighter way. This just don't give up hope. It's always hope. And Allison? Yeah, I would say find something to, to, to hold on to, whether it's another person. If you need that in the beginning, that's fine. Whether it's a, a pretty painting or a song or something that's going to keep you going from one second to the next. I'd say you deserve peace. You're not alone. You're bent. You're not broken. Usually by the point someone's come to therapy, they've already been through a lot of fucking hell and they got through it. And so (laughs) there has to be uh, a whole lot of assets there. So I don't have really like a saying for that, but I really like reminding people of the courage and and the, the strength that it took to get through whatever challenges came across, even if they got through it in a non-therapeutic or non-traditional way. Holy crap. Absolutely. You get through that (laughs) and you're already here sitting in front of me and you took a step to come into this door. Even listening to this. Yeah. You know, like giving yourself the opportunity to learn and educate yourself and to be open-minded and willing to get more tools in your toolbox. Like it takes effort. And so whenever I have clients, I'm sure you do the same. Like when they're like, thank you so much for helping me. It's like, no, like you, yeah. you did, you, you did, did it. This. You did this. You showed up. I could just give you things and you could just completely ignore me or shut the door on my face, but you continue to show up. You continue to be open. You continue to put in the work. Yeah. I got to add something to that. Cause when Kat said the word effort, here's something that someone told me recently that it had to be like the perfect time of day where it just really sunk in. But Every effort counts. Mm. I really like to remind myself of that. Life is not easy. It's not easy for anyone. It's okay if, you know, all you did was get up and eat some eggs and then went back to bed. Every effort counts. Mm. You count. That's good, right? Everything. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? Always. (laughs) My biggest thing that I would have people realize is pain is unavoidable. That's a sad part of life if that's all you have. So I had to find a purpose to it. I realized that I can suffer through anything if it leads to something. And so being able to turn the pain and being able to turn the traumas in life into positive things. I talk about my incarceration and I do it on a regular basis so some people don't have to because I turn this into a purpose. I know it's not that easy. I'm not claiming that it's that easy. It does take the effort and it does take, you know, because sometimes I'll brush up against my traumas. We'll sit here and we'll talk about certain things and I'll get real close to something and be like, ooh, I didn't know that I still had that going on. Right. Things don't go away. They get mitigated. No. Mm-hmm. They become better. And so they have mm-hmm. purpose behind it. So if you were going to have pain anyway, Find a way to turn it into something useful. Find a way to turn it into something that fuels you. Find a way to turn it into something that other people benefit from. Because every single person is a unique resource. And your only job on this planet is to figure out what you bring to it. I was reflecting and listening and you mentioned just finding another explanation or another purpose or like what I thought and what I interpreted that as was reframing the narrative. And I talk, I have one client in particular right now that I don't think they realize how special they are to me. All my clients are special to me, but this one in particular has definitely touched me in a a different way and impacted me in a different way in a sense of 
they've had so much trauma and like different barriers of like systemic oppression, institutional racism and poverty and trauma history and you name it, like all these different issues and systemic issues and interpersonal issues in their life. And for so long, they were seeing the world through this lens that the world was against them. And in all honesty, as as a as a person of color, as a black man, in one point, it's not a lie. There's a lot of systems that are out to get you. It's invalidating to say, oh, you're wrong. It's more mm-hmm. validating say you're right those things are there and how can we reframe that narrative to give you your power back and that's what I like to talk about with my clients is like is giving you your power back because these systems Mm. like incarceration and 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 the legal system is so it strips you of your humanity and it strips you of your power powerlessness is something that I felt I'm sure you felt Mm -hmm. we've all felt together and collectiveness with our people with our people and together it's how can we have that collective action and to gain our power back to fight what is the the criminal legal system and the unjust system itself. And reasons and excuses look the same. I think that's an important thing because all of those things are absolutely reasons why things are the way they are, but they don't have to be excuses for why they will continue to be. And so I think this is hugely important because every conversation, nothing gets done in the world. That's why I always frame these things in conversation, why I relate, why I frame them in relationship. Nothing gets done in the world except through relationship. And so this that's idea true. of working with our mental health is really relationship with ourself. And when our relationship with ourself is in line, then we relate to the world in a different way. We've been expanding and we have new staff. And whenever the question comes up, how do I handle this? How do I address this? How do I talk to somebody? Honestly, Mm -hmm. I don't care what else we do. Let's defend the truth. And if somebody doesn't like the truth, then so be it. So so, such huge parts of our mental health is a matter of feeding lies. We're only as healthy as our lies. And so we're feeding these false narratives. This is just a matter of figuring out who we are, what we bring to the collective and the systemic issues that are in place. The biggest thing about systemic issues is they are created to make people believe that this is the way that they will always be so they don't have to continue to apply the pressure and people will start to apply it to themselves. Right. And maintain the status quo. Absolutely. That's what I think is one of the, my favorite things about working working in social work and work and just be, the values aligning so much with my personal values that I just hold deeply rooted inside of me. And, and that is that is disrupting the system and that is pushing against the system because it wants you to fight each other. Yes, <laughs> it wants so you to true. do that because it takes up time and it takes up space, the space that you can mm-hmm. be using to fight against it. So I always absolutely, yeah, I coined another term which goes perfectly with this, too, because I spent a lot of time in my car driving. So I'm always processing things. And I realized that one of the things that the system does is I call it systemic laryngitis. And it's designed to infect other people so that they lose their voice. Mm. Wow. And so this is part of what mental health is about, too. It's about finding your voice. Nobody else can silence you at some point in time when you you can't shut me up. You know, and and, and people are and, and people are like, well, why do you share so much of your story? Why did I live it? I have but one regret. And that's crazy from coming from somebody who served 27 years on a bank robbery. I did two on my A prefix and I've done two in the county. I've done 31 years of incarceration. I was on I was on uh, somehow tied to the system from 1985 until January of this year. So why would I not share my story? Why would I not own my story? So the only thing that I regret is that people got hurt. Mm. Everything else was worth it because I'm so proud of who I am today. I'm so proud of the fact that I can stand in my truth and that everybody doesn't have to. And so this is all about just finding ourselves and being the best that we possibly can for ourselves, for one another, because we can't break those systems down unless everybody's operating optimally. And got to shine a light on it. Right. And a brighter light, a brighter light. Yeah. It's also recognizing that it's okay to take rest. Like it's okay to take rest. I'm um, still working on that. One. Right. Mm-hmm. And with that, we will be resting. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Allison. Thank, thank you, you so Judy. Much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for thank, including me. This is wonderful. Thank you for lending your light to a brighter way. As corny as that may be, I love the name too because it just leads itself into everything. I love it. I do. I like that. Thank you for listening to Conversations About a Brighter Way, Reentry Through Relationship and spending some time getting to know a little bit about other humans. We'd like to thank some people that helped to make conversations about a brighter way possible. We'd like to thank our volunteer podcast editor, Patrick Domingo. You heard him in season one as well. Patrick is a multidisciplined artist based in Arizona. For contact information and to view their work, visit their website, patrickdomingojr.com. The beautiful music you hear in the intro and thank yous was written and performed by Chelsea-based singer-songwriter Annie Caps. If you're looking for a rootsy vibe, a touch of twang, and a soulful groove, look no further. You can find her at AnnieCaps.com. We'd like to thank Grove Studios for the discount for our podcast, our individual donors, United Way of Washtenaw County, the Ann Arbor Thrift, Nation Outside, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, our volunteers, mentors, and mentees. The contact information for A Brighter Way is info at abrighterway.org and 734-896-3770. Oh, and wait. Subscribe and follow us on social media so you don't miss out on a single episode. And visit the website abrighterway.org for donation opportunities. And if you want to reach out to ask questions or send comments, you can email volunteering at a brighter way.org. This is Robin. And this is Adam. Peace out. Mm-hmm.